Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, interviews with people who have special insights into education from preschool all the way through adult education. I'm Jim Sean, your host. We're live streaming every Wednesday at noon, posted on YouTube later, and the Hawaii Educational Policy Center. And our guest today is someone who's gone on an interesting journey from media to working with Kamehameha Schools to Hawaiian Airlines and Potticelli. Welcome to our show. Thanks, Jim. Nice to be here. Tell us a little bit about your educational background. Well, I was uh, raised in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, I attended um, Aina Haina Elementary School, proud um, public school graduate, and then went on to Punahou School. And then I went off to the mainland to Michigan State University to study um, journalism. Mm -hmm. um, and after working for a little while on the mainland, I came home. Okay, and then you worked for a couple of TV stations? I did. I worked for uh, KITV twice. Uh -huh. I worked for KHON. Um, and I worked for the Honolulu Advertiser. Uh -huh. So how long were you a professional journalist? I was, if you count, uh, when I started as an intern and a campus correspondent in college, uh, <laughs> um, I give myself 22 years. Wow, for 22 that's years. quite yeah. a bit of experience. It was, right? it was a long time. And along the way, I assume you had the need to cover or report on education stories. Um, education was never my beat, but when I was a general assignment reporter, yes, we would cover education. Mm. So just a little bit of a hint of what about education would catch the eye of the media? What was of interest? What was boring? Well, you know, I, I always like to tell people that reporters are kind of after two things, right? There are two C's. Um, conflict and change. Uh -huh. And uh, when you get the two C's in one story, then you <laughs> kind of hit the jackpot. So that's what uh, reporters tend to look at. Um, as a communications professional, I like to put a, a third C in there, and that's context. Uh -huh. um, and um, I think that what reporters most often are looking for is an example of something that's reform, something that's different. Often it's negative, a school that's failing, um, mm -hmm. Our kids are doing badly, uh, but on the flip side, there's always room for stories on um, some sort of reform that's doing well or mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. having great impact. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. But education is day in, day out, uh, all year round, every year. Um, I imagine that uh, there aren't that many big education stories. I mean, in the in the in the universe of interesting things to report that the public wants to know. Is education up there? I don't think that um, the reporters today are covering education the way the reporters of yesterday did, where uh -huh. there were reporters who were assigned to the Board of Education and they mm. reported routinely on policy issues and things like that. Uh -huh. um, what I see happening in the media today around education um, is often about school test scores, yes. um, a little bit about reform, mm. um, but there's always room for the heartwarming, wonderful story. It's yes. the kid from Waianae who goes to Harvard. Yes, yes. You know, uh -huh. um, great stories of success in our mm -hmm. educational system, um, I think, grab everybody. Um, and then now there's a little bit more of a wrinkle because you've got stories that go online and then get fed to Facebook and they have a life of their own. Yes. You know, uh -huh. and so to me, you know, you aim more for those stories that really make people um, feel warm in the heart because mm -hmm. those have life after the the actual vehicle of reporting. So uh, when you were the reporter, uh, you might have been the source of getting that news, packaging it, but now there's all these bloggers and as you mentioned, yeah. the social media, yeah. you're, uh, well, reporters are in a, in a very different context of multiple players now. Yeah, yeah you know, I really think that um, the new media landscape changed everything mm -hmm. really dramatically. And I watched it from the other side. I was no longer reporting. Mm -hmm. um, I was at Kamehameha Schools at the time, but I remember saying to my staff, we need to play in that sandbox. Uh -huh. That is mass communication mm -hmm. on an individual level. So suddenly everybody is their own mass communicator because they have, you know, 200 followers on Facebook or right. 300 followers on Facebook. Uh -huh. And they become influencers on their own in a mm -hmm. way that um, used to be reserved or the domain for people who were anointed that way, put on the Board mm -hmm. of Education or whatever it was. Um, so I think that the whole landscape for communicating has changed. And 
when I reach out now um, on the public relations side of the house, I'm very much aware of those bloggers and what mm -hmm. their reach is um, because people are consuming those. Um, they can consume them on their own time. Mm -hmm. They don't have to sit down and make an appointment to do it. Yes. They don't have to wait for the paper to show up on their door. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just fed all the time. Um, and so I think that more and more that is an influential conduit mm -hmm. for communication. So Hawaii is, is often talked about as being perhaps a little more of a face-to-face -face culture, right? And it seems to me that in the old days, uh, reporting and finding the news was going down physically, going through the archives, looking, interviewing, yeah. but now it's all online. Yes. It's amazing what you can find <laughs> on the internet, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and uh, it used to be that it was a discipline that was taught. Journalists were taught to go and do your research first. Mm -hmm. Now it's the first thing everybody does. Well, what can I find on Google? What can I, I mean, whether mm -hmm. you, you're picking a restaurant, okay, let me go on Yelp and see mm -hmm. what people think about it, you know. Mm -hmm. You shop online, oh, what do the reviews say? All mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So I think we've all sort of changed the way, um, the way that we do things. You went to Kamehameha. It's a huge organization. Yeah. Talk about your first impressions of what that was like. Well, you know, um, I went to Kamehameha at a time when, uh, when it was really almost under crisis because um, its admissions policy was being challenged. Um, and it was a, I just thought it was a fascinating um, experience. Um, first of all, I'm not Native Hawaiian, Mm -hmm. um, but I absolutely believe in the mission of that school. And so I felt really honored and privileged to be able to try and protect mm -hmm. um, the ability of Native Hawaiian children to have preference mm -hmm. to go to a school like that. Mm -hmm. I thought the school itself was um, wonderful, coming out of a dark time on its own, but very much committed to um, expanding into the community and uh, making sure that they reached more Native Hawaiian learners. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, it was an interesting place because it was a developer, and so uh -huh. it had land that mm -hmm. it was looking at optimizing for the benefit of, mm -hmm. the, of the mission. So um, my first impressions of it were amazing place, huge community impact, mm -hmm. huge expectation mm -hmm. from the community, and mm -hmm. not just Native Hawaiians, but uh, non-Hawaiians too. Um, so it was a, a pretty thrilling place to be. Mm -hmm. and, and you got there right when it was in crisis where the trustees were? No, that was, all, that was already over. Oh, I started over. there in 2005. Oh, okay. And prior to that, I had worked as a consultant for them. I see. Yeah. So, so th you, they had, well, they have a, a board of trustees, right? Mm -hmm. How many are on that board? Five, Five. trustees. So it's a yeah. very small very group small. compared to other boards. I and they were making a governance shift mandated by the court mm -hmm. away from a trustee-led management system to a CEO-based management system. Mm -hmm. So when I uh, first started working with Kamehameha, their first CEO, a man named Hamilton McCubbin, was there. Uh -huh. uh, and then I stayed through, um, I joined permanently when mm -hmm. DJ Mailer was there. Mm -hmm. And so the trustees were making a very important and necessary shift um, toward letting the CEO manage it and having the trustees become the policy makers. So before then, the trustees were making all kinds of educational yeah. calls, right. right? Then they shifted and they hired a CEO yeah. and, and so they became sort of above the fray a little right. bit, you know. Right. Like any board should do, right? Uh -huh. A properly run board mm -hmm. um, doesn't manage, mm -hmm. but establishes policy and provides that kind of guidance. Mm -hmm. yeah. So micromanagement kind of shifted away from, from that. Yeah. Uh, and, but they, you mentioned they had two purposes. So you come over, you're head of what, communications? Yeah, community relations and communications. So what does that mean exactly? You know, well, you know. Are you sitting in on all the decisions or, you know what? Uh, not all the decisions, but I think that the, I feel as though um, a good communications um, staff uh, doesn't make decisions, but informs decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, um, community relations and communications was created as a division with community relations purposefully put first, mm. because there was this enormous stakeholder community. Right. Um, there was a huge challenge to the mission of the organization, mm -hmm. and it was recognized that there was a need to make sure that the stakeholder community um, was, um, you know, their, their concerns were taken into consideration, and mm -hmm. there was a good relationship with the, 
with the com with the community that were the intended beneficiaries of the trust, and then mm -hmm. beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, we were always consulted about what would be the um, impact of decisions. Mm -hmm. How were people um, probably going to respond to it? How would they see it? What are the mm -hmm. different points of view? And I think a really good communications team is going to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, an old boss of mine, Kitty Lagaretta, used to say, I'm, I'm the one who's, um, you know, getting up in the middle of the night over these things that I see. I mean, that's part of our role is mm -hmm. this is something that's going to have an impact on you. Um, let's plan for it. Let's make sure we understand it. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, let's make sure that our decision takes that into consideration. Mm -hmm. So an image of, of we make a decision, you communicate it, that's a very small part of what you do or yeah, did, right? Yes. Yeah. That shouldn't be actually the model. Uh -huh. It shouldn't be, here's the decision, you communicate it. Uh -huh. I think really effective communications does need to be at the table mm -hmm. um, at the decision-making level. Now, you know, there's all there's a million different things that go into making a decision, whether you're mm -hmm. a nonprofit or a for-profit. You know, you have myriad um, constituencies and things to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. But then you have to know, how am I going to communicate this to people? Mm -hmm. um, what order does it come in? What are their concerns going to be? Mm -hmm. How do I prepare to it, you know, to answer those concerns? Mm -hmm. um, because in a vacuum of information, um, things spin out of control pretty rapidly. People make up their own stories they if do. you do not right. inform them well. And they see your silence as assent. Mm -hmm. In so so you're really um, staff, research, uh, taking the pulse of the community and stakeholders. You're really part of, of that operation as well as communicating it, yeah? Yeah, so at Kamehameha Schools, for example, in community relations and communications, we had people who were in charge of the alumni magazine, and they mm -hmm. were putting that out. Mm -hmm. um, we had teams that were dedicated to um, the education mm -hmm. uh, side of the house the land asset side of the house because there's huge uh, ag land and um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know other interests and then the com the uh, commercial real estate side mm -hmm. of the house mm -hmm. the, the three areas that were really active mm -hmm. um, and they managed a lot of the communication and any kind of campaign that needed to be done mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the community outreach we also had a strong um, internet web presence so we had a website that we managed mm -hmm. um, and then later on we bro we uh, branched into Facebook and other social media mm -hmm. um, as a way to engage people and help them understand what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, you know, uh, Kamehameha Schools at the time st still does own a lot of these. They ran Windward Mall, uh, Royal Hawaiian Center, right, yeah. Kahala Mall. Mm -hmm. They were the um, landowners under Kahala Mall. Mm -hmm. um, so we established uh, this program called the Malama Card mm -hmm. um, that allowed people to get a little discount if they had a card. Um, and that card was tied to uh, a Facebook page mm -hmm. um, where we were allowed to help them understand what the mission of the schools were and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, really trying to connect uh, and underscore what that school existed for mm -hmm. to our many different constituencies in many different ways. So even though it's a private entity, right, being a major landowner, there must have been a lot of political issues that they were embroiled in whether they wanted to or not. Uh, sure. I don't know if the leasehold thing was over with. But it was over with. Yeah. Um, you know, after the, um, after the broken trust era, um, the trust pulled back a lot from the political mm -hmm. side of that. They became um, less enmeshed in it. Yes. But of course, yes, they were a major landowner mm -hmm. and they were developing land and are developing land. And mm -hmm. so, um, and there is expectation mm -hmm. from a large community presence. I feel the same thing at Hawaiian Airlines, even uh -huh. though we're not, you know, we're completely private. Mm -hmm. um, there is an expectation about um, using that at Kamehameha Schools, um, in Kamehameha Schools' case, using that land for affordable housing mm -hmm. and other things. So mm -hmm. there were always issues at the legislature that would come up. Uh -huh. um, Kamehameha Schools was a big proponent of charter schools, especially mm -hmm. through the Native Hawaiian startup charters. Mm -hmm. And so we did a lot of proactive outreach at the legislature on behalf of the charter schools mm -hmm. and that movement. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking with Ann Botticelli about communications, community relations, education. We'll be back in one minute. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, 
president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii, Education Movers, Shakers, Reformers. We're talking with Ann Botticelli. And you were, you were speaking about Kamehameha and just getting into the, um, the notion of how proactive this school was in promoting charters and other. Talk a little bit more of, of how they saw themselves, sure. uh, how they branded, how they, their self-image. Well, you know, the schools knew that they were only reaching a small fraction of uh, children mm -hmm. um, with their three campuses. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to um, affect uh, educational outcomes for Native Hawaiian children all over the, children all over the state. So mm -hmm. they actually, Kamehameha schools actually um, pushed for and got enacted Act Two, which set up whole Kako'o Corporation, yes. uh, uh, on whose board I sit today, uh, and that was really um, uh, part of a plan to go out and foster uh, educational transformation uh -huh. in communities where Native Hawaiian learners are. Uh -huh. They also had a program called Ho'olako Like, which was focused on the startup charter schools. So mm -hmm. these were the schools that were like Hakipu'u out in Kaneohe, which is yes. a great school, which were saying, kids aren't learning in um, classrooms necessarily. Let's mm -hmm. take them into a different environment. Mm -hmm. And that has been a really rich, the whole charter movement to me has been a really rich um, sort of uh, training ground almost mm -hmm. for different types of educational methodology, project-based learning, things mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. um, and a testing ground for whether or not those are effective ways of mm -hmm. educating kids. Now, the, the, the charters have suffered with uh, less, less than equal funding, many calculate, yeah. no facilities. Why, from a media point of view, why have they struggled so much to get traction among decision makers? You know, it's a really good question. I think that, um, uh, I, well, there have been um, negative stories about charter schools that I think affect all of them. Conflict. Conflict, uh, maybe improper governance, yeah. um, spending that, that uh, perhaps wasn't um, the best. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a little bit part of the problem. Um, I was involved in, I've been involved in charter school since my son was a student at Wailai mm -hmm. Elementary back in the late 90s, so mm -hmm. almost from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it was clear to me back then, being on the board, that this was really a grand experiment and so many, the I's weren't dotted and the T's mm -hmm. weren't crossed and we, mm -hmm. you know, people didn't know how uh, how to handle the union thing, where, mm -hmm. what, what was going to happen with seniority, could teachers come in and mm -hmm. bump other teachers and what would happen with your uh, cafeteria staff and all those things sort of had mm -hmm. to be ironed out mm -hmm. uh, as the charter school movement was was mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. um, and so I think watching this movement blossom and grow and actually being spectators um, to the bumps in the road um, maybe has given um, the wrong impression of charters mm -hmm. um, but I think they're great incubators for innovation and change um, and should be supported. And I do think, obviously, I'm on the board of Ho'okako'o, I do think that these schools ought to be supported equally to the uh, public schools, the other public schools. What advice would you give to individual charters and charters as a group to be more successful in getting equity, you know, in, in funding and, and whatnot, and not having a, an occasional negative story? I mean, if you were in charge of charter PR, you know, is there something that you see that's missing right now from 
You know, I think that charters are doing a lot of things right. Down at the legislature, they are working together. Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to be a collective. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important. Um, I don't think that um, the transformational aspects of charters are coming out that well. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, a new Inui school, which is fantastic, um, Hawaiian Immersion School. Um, you see some good stories about it. You don't see enough. Kamaile Academy, a Ho'okaka'o school, has an 80% college-bound rate in mm -hmm. graduation class last year. 100% graduated, 100% mm -hmm. graduation rate, 80% went to college. One of the students was actually accepted at Dartmouth, mm -hmm. decided that was too far to go and, and stayed here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. You know, full-ride scholarships to Kenyon, mm -hmm. which is a mm -hmm. great college, University of Rochester. That's a real great story. Mm -hmm. um, how they did it and how they have been able to, um, you know, inculcate that desire to go on mm -hmm. uh, and um, continue education, I think is a fantastic story. But that story isn't really being told. It isn't being told and it's not, it's, it has been told a little bit. Like mm -hmm. there's a little, there was a front page article, the first graduating class, mm -hmm. and that was nice. Yes. Um, but the key is going to be how do you continue to tell that story and keep mm -hmm. the media interested in the story. Mm -hmm. You know, reporters have short attention spans. Mm -hmm. And I can say as a former reporter. So do legislators. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And one of the things is you go out and you work all day on getting a mm -hmm. story together, and you really don't want to follow it the next day because you're kind of afraid you're going to find the one person you should have talked to and didn't get to, right, and right. suddenly your great story is going to be fatally flawed, and yeah. nobody really wants to face that, right? Yeah. So I think that that's an inherent flaw in the system mm -hmm. it, when, you, when, you, when it's hard for people to follow up on their own work. Mm -hmm. There's also this notion of, well, I did that story about Kamile. Well, okay, there, that was that there. story about Kamile, yeah. Yeah. but there's an ongoing trend here at Kamile. Mm -hmm. So I think it's incumbent upon those of us who are the communicators of that to um, find different ways to communicate mm -hmm. that and get people interested mm -hmm. and find the different peg that's going to say, well, well, this is something that I really mm -hmm. ought to look into. Now, you mentioned Ho'okako, which is an organization set up to support originally DOE schools that converted yeah. to charter that had a lot of Hawaiians and which Kamehameha and a little bit of OHA money came into support. So you're on this board. <clears throat> of a kind of a management organization, right? But you're not the communications person anymore. Talk a little bit about that difference of, of serving the decision maker and becoming the decision maker. Well, um... Or is there a difference? I don't, I don't think there's a difference. Okay. I think in every good um, communications endeavor, right, mm -hmm. you start with a plan. Mm -hmm. You identify what your objectives are. You identify your strategy for getting there and your measures along the way. And here's how I'm going to get there, and here's what success is going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just good, uh, that's a good formula for any mm -hmm. governance, mm -hmm. you know. And as I've um, moved more into the private sector, I mean, this is what we do at Hawaiian Airlines, right? Mm -hmm. We have we have an idea of where we need to go. Mm -hmm. We have an idea of how this organization is going to get there. And I have an idea of how my little group, com Corporate Communications, is going to participate in having us get there. Mm -hmm. um, and you measure yourself against those benchmarks that mm -hmm. you set. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, so whether I'm serving the board by managing a communication strategy or sitting mm -hmm. on the board and just sort of saying, well, what's the strategy for the whole organization? Mm -hmm. There's sort of one and the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the approach is one and the same. Now, education, while we may have grand goals, 100% will graduate and go to Harvard or something, right? That goal is way beyond our reach, always, right? So, how is, how is success measured in education in a meaningful way, other than just getting better, but never quite grasping what it is? You know, I think that is, you're on to what I think is the, has been the most difficult thing, especially with the schools that Ho'okakao serves. Mm -hmm. These are very transient populations. Mm -hmm. We often don't know, we don't have any longitudinal measure. So we don't, we're measuring different kids every year. Mm -hmm. um, and you're being held to that standard. You mm -hmm. know, is your student body as a whole growing? Well, if half your student body left mm -hmm. and half is new, you know, you're not measuring the same thing. How do you know if you're making progress or not? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that um, 
first of all, I think having every child go to Harvard is a bad aspiration mm -hmm. because yes, that's yeah. a. I'm sure you would agree. It's yeah. a just a, that's a very specific school. Right, and, right, right, um, right. I think that. Uh, there are better measures. Um, having every child go to college, I think that's great. Uh, having every child go to college or have a career plan, so graduate college or career ready, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and then along the way, how do we get there? What do we need to do to make sure that our kids are going to get there? Mm -hmm. um, and how are we going to adjust our curriculum to do it? Mm -hmm. And is it working? Mm -hmm. You know, Do we have student engagement? Is our tardiness level uh, dropping. Yes. You know, um, I think in a lot of areas, charter schools have the opportunity to really engage mm -hmm. parents, and that ought to be a measure, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, the engagement of your parents in a child's education to me is critical mm -hmm. for the success of that. And I, I know that from my own experience as a charter school parent versus a parent who's, you know, my, my daughter went to a private school from kindergarten. Uh -huh. And my experience with her in school and my experience with my son in school were very different things uh -huh. because I served on that charter school board. I see. So, so, so there, there's a level of engagement here with multiple stakeholders that require multiple communication strategies to communicate with? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How does each area want to receive its information, but the mm. information has to be the same. Right. You know, and it usually should have some sort of foundation, mm -hmm. foundational or overarching message that you're always uh, communicating. You, you, know? you mentioned the transient nature of the school population in some of these schools. Yeah. In your observation, is that true of all the schools in, the, in a particular area or just those sort of charter schools? Well, um, I don't know so much about the startup charters, okay. and Ho'okako'o has conversion charters, so we are a neighborhood school. Right. But what we've seen, particularly in, Wai in um, Kamaile, on the Waianae Coast, um, huge homeless populations there. Right. Yeah. So they're coming in and going out, coming in and going out. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very difficult thing to manage, mm -hmm. and um, sometimes um, large chunks of a certain culture, mm -hmm. you know, are there, and then mm -hmm. there's that. Uh, culture to manage. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and I know that the same was true at another school um, that Ho'okako'o oversees, which is Waimea Middle School on the Big Island. Uh, there's a period of time when there's a fair amount of transients in that right. community as well. Mm -hmm. um, our third school, Koala Pu'u, um, not so much transients. Mm -hmm. um, and that school um, has done actually really remarkably well. Yeah. Is there a a, a particular strategy or approach in communicating with Hawaiian stakeholders that's different than other stakeholders, from Kamehameha uh, to the Ho'okako and, and many of your Hawaiian conversion charter schools. Uh, are there things that that a corporate would, would you know world would do, but just this just doesn't work for these parents or these communities? Yeah, I think that, I wouldn't say necessarily that it's a Native Hawaiian or non-Hawaiian thing. Okay. I think it might be a school thing. Mm -hmm. um, or it might be a, um, there might be a difference when you're dealing um, with people who are of different socioeconomic backgrounds. So mm -hmm. the way they are used to consuming their information might be very different. Mm -hmm. um, often when, um, when you're dealing with um, more impoverished communities, it's very much an into the grassroots, face to face, mm -hmm. you know, high touch uh -huh. um, kind of communication. Because mm -hmm. they might not have access to email mm -hmm. or they might not, um, you know, be newspaper readers and, and so forth. So I think that the key is always first of all, you want to be in charge of your own communication. And mm -hmm. I think that from my back in the day when I was a reporter, often the newspaper or the television was used as the conduit to the general community. But uh -huh. I think now, especially in the age of uh, social media, um, you, you don't want to let anyone else be the conduit to okay. your community. We're, we'll get into that okay. social media a little bit more after our one minute break. Why? Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island and a physician. I host a show weekly called Healthcare in Hawaii where we talk about the most important issues in healthcare for our state, whether it's the dengue fever outbreak, the state of our public hospitals, how to find physicians and nurses for our patients, or really just the best things to do for our family's health. That's what you'll find on this show. I'll bring experts to your attention and we'll have a free flowing dialogue. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Mover Shakers Reformers, talking with Ann Botticelli. And you were just getting into 
uh, the social media, yeah. right? Uh, before we do that, now you work for a corporate entity, yeah. a corporate board. How yeah. big is the Hawaiian Airlines board? Oh, I think it's 12 or 13. 12, people, so a little yeah. bit bigger than some of the yeah. others, yeah. right? What is, what is that like of being in charge of communications and, I don't know, community relations for a corporation versus an education organization? Well, um, first of all, your, uh, your stakeholders are different. Right. right, and you're not coalesced around something as clear as education. Mm -hmm. So you have your. I work for a publicly traded company. Um, our shareholders are one audience, mm -hmm. but I also we also are a major um, business mm -hmm. here locally mm -hmm. in a place that relies on our product mm -hmm. to travel around the state, and that's a completely different audience. And mm -hmm. often those two are very at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the uh, shareholder. Uh, interest is in seeing their investment grow mm -hmm. and the local community interest is in seeing um, access mm -hmm. uh, to, to our product grow. Um, so they are very different mm -hmm. um, and uh, sometimes the, the messages do clash, you know, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. we grow, which is a good thing for the state and the state's economy, um, sometimes our local residents are saying, okay, but what does that mean for me? And mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. forget that you are Hawaii's flagship airline. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Are, are you kind of uh, got into it a little bit? But are the questions and concerns of a board of governance in the corporate world that different from Kamehameha trustees or Ho'okaku board? I mean, how do those boards look at their operations? Do they ask similar questions? Uh, I think they ask similar questions, but it's, it depends on what it is. So if you're, like, Kamehameha Schools is a nonprofit right. um, organization that exists to serve a certain constituency. Mm -hmm. the, the, the decisions are always going to revolve around mm -hmm. serving that constituency, and often it's about spending money to mm -hmm. um, serve that constituency mm -hmm. as opposed to um, earning the money to have the money to... Mm -hmm. serve that constituency. Yeah. So um, Kamehameha Schools had both of those going on, but there's a lot of uh, giving. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just, you're existing to mm -hmm. um, provide services to a certain community. Corporate boards are, are less so, you know. It's less about the giving than it is about um, providing a product that people want to consume mm -hmm. um, and people want to pay to consume. And that's a month-to-month, year-to-year change if you if your services go down absolutely you know. it's always evaluating it's yeah. always looking at the competition what is uh -huh. the competition doing mm -hmm. um, are we still a good value for money proposition are mm -hmm. we still offering something that sets us apart are they doing something really cool um, should we be doing that as well um, even down to you know access to on on our website for example mm -hmm. you know is our website as easy to manage as it should be mm -hmm. is it giving people what they need to make the choice, mm -hmm. you know? Are we gonna be one of the first ones that's called up on Expedia instead of on the second page where nobody bothers to go, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, all of that are, um, are decisions that are, are things that have to be looked at um, in a privately, you know, run, mm -hmm. publicly held company. Um, they are too in any organization that wants to be sustainable for the future. Mm -hmm. You have to manage yourself very well um, but um, with a nonprofit that exists to serve, there's a lot more focus on what are we going to do to serve uh, this community. Do you do a lot of surveys and polls? Is, is that part of the, the job of communications is being your own SMS research on marketing? Yeah, sometimes we do surveys and polls. Um, I think the best way to communicate is to be a consumer of, mm. of the news of people's blogs, mm. um, you know, y you should be able to say, I have an idea of how this constituency is going to react based on mm. my own observation of that constituency. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it it's time consuming mm -hmm. because you spend a lot of time consuming right. everybody else's information, right. um, but it's really beneficial mm -hmm. and it's really hard to sort of communicate blind mm -hmm. into an audience that you don't understand. Do you expect or advise members of a board to also be blog in the blogosphere and watching and listening and participating in that way, or do they rely on you? 
I don't expect them to do that. <laughs> you know, a lot of them do. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that's um, mm. that's our kuleana in communication. Twenty years ago, uh, if if Hawaiian Air was going to open, say, a new route or whatnot, maybe there'd be a a press release. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, now it's different. For one thing, you might do a press release anyway. But are press releases the same, different, shorter? You know. They're the same. You still do them, uh -huh. um, but um, but they they don't just go to news organizations. They go into a uh, you know a PR uh, news service mm -hmm. that sends them everywhere. Uh -huh. um, I think often now um, I hate to say this. No offense to my people and my colleagues in the news media, but um, often the news releases end up published. On their own. In yeah. the old days, that never would have happened. It Give them a good happened. quote, and it shows up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or your entire news releases, you know, in the yes. newspaper. Yeah. Um, and it used to be that was the starting point for a reporter. Right. right. Um, now I think because there's so you know online mm. has changed everything because mm. there's this constant need mm. to feed that ma. You've just got to put product mm. out there, um, and so they will take things and put it out. Um, whereas before, if you just had a daily paper to do, mm -hmm. why well, you had all day to really look around. Okay, right, so right. here's what Hawaiian's doing. Let me go see what the competition is doing. Let mm. me go see what the detractors have to say about this. Uh -huh. You know, let me put some depth and texture to this story mm -hmm. instead of just saying, oh, okay, here's some information. I'll put it out there for you to consume. Do you even care if it's on the 6 o'clock news? I think some people do. Some people yeah. do, but in the, in the, because there's so much... We're being bombarded with stuff, yeah. you know. I yeah. mean, uh, young people don't watch the news, no. don't read the newspaper. No, they watch like, uh, yeah. you know, last week, this week, and, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. comedy shows. Right, They right. give them the news sort of overlaid with comedy called Bear Report, uh -huh, you know, which uh -huh. isn't on anymore. But um, I think that is, I think that you are looking at an, uh, an industry that has seen the world change mm -hmm. and is struggling to figure out how to make that change you work talk for about them. Media, the media the industry. Media, yeah. um, you know, what do you do with the online product? Mm -hmm. How do you monetize that online product? Mm -hmm. How much of your talent goes to that online product? With television stations now, mm -hmm. locally in Hawaii, I see that they do mm -hmm. reports on TV, but they also have to do something online. They're out there doing Twitter and mm -hmm. you know sending back things for the Facebook page mm -hmm. and. Um, promoting it all day long. Um, that gets in the way of just hunkering mm -hmm. down and figuring out what, sto what the story is, you know, and what everybody thinks about it. I keep hearing that email is so passe, you know, but th there's a whole professional layer in society that does communicate through email, but busy people are inundated. Yeah. You know, an executive, whether they be in government or whatnot, come in at the beginning of the day and there's a hundred emails, yeah. right? Yeah. Do you rely on email? To I love email. Yeah, I yeah. love email. I, I over communicate on email. I think there uh -huh. are times when I should pick up the phone. Oh, and you're I just, really old school. Then, and I just want to do yeah. yeah my email. I do get a hundred emails a day, and mm. most of them are things that are over the transom. Mm -hmm. I would consider almost spam that mm. I don't even look at. I just click, 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 and get rid of them. And finally, because we seem to be shifting to a visual video world, right? If you don't have a good video clip. Is that a disadvantage? Do you always strive, along with the press release, to send a video clip of the, you know, the, the plane arriving in whatever new place it is? Or well, I would send a video clip of a plane arriving in a new place. Yeah. I wouldn't send a video clip of somebody standing at a podium and talking. Yeah, right, right. I think it still has to be um, interesting. Uh huh. Yeah, visually interesting. Visually interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, this is very interesting because every organization, whether it be educational or not, has to struggle with this issue of who we are, how do we communicate with our immediate stakeholders, yeah. and how do we communicate with the outside world. Right. right. And build your ambassadors. That's another thing I should have mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, your parents who are really having a good experience, or kids are having a good experience at your school. Um, Ask them to come out and support you. Uh -huh. You know, they have Facebook pages too. Yes. Um, when there are issues down at the legislature, bring them along. Mm -hmm. Help people see that there are real people 
being mm -hmm. affected by these schools. When a child really gets engaged in their school and mm -hmm. the parent gets engaged in that child's learning, it's a magical thing. Mm -hmm. So um, help people see what that magic looks like mm -hmm. um, because people do want to support places where magic is, happen yes. is happening. You yes. know? Mm -hmm. And there's magic happening out there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for thank all you. these insights. We've been talking with Ann Botticelli about communications, education, and the world of media. We'll be back again next week with another mover, shaker, reformer. Aloha.